And now I'm sure our good friend and host, Dr. Watson, is waiting, so let's go in and join him. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Here, Watson. Down, down, down Monty. Down, down there. Dogs seem very chipper tonight. Yes, tonight, yes, but they've been in disgrace most of the day, Mr. Bartell. Oh? What have they been up to? After the seals again, Doctor? Oh, my boy, this time it was chickens. They got into my neighbor's coop and had a delightful time. Fortunately, there were no casualties, but I'm afraid that my, uh, <laughs> my good neighbor policy has suffered a slight diplomatic strain. But you come here to listen to Sherlock Holmes' adventures, not those of my dog, so uh, draw up your usual chair and make yourself comfortable, and uh, I'll get on with tonight's story. Last week, Doctor, you told us it was a case in which Sherlock Holmes found the solution without ever meeting any of the suspects. That's quite correct, Mr. Bartell. As remarkable an, an exhibition of long-distance detection as I ever recall. But uh, judge the story for yourself, my boy. It was in the autumn of 1903, and... Sherlock Holmes was about to retire to his bee farm on the Sussex Downs. I must confess, Mr. Bartell, that my heart was heavy during those last few weeks we spent at Baker Street. I thought of the countless adventures that we'd shared together. I remembered those many evenings of quiet comradeship and companionship. A fire blazing away in the hearth as Holmes lay back in the shadows playing his beloved violin. And then, Mr. Bartell, as so often happened, there'd be a violent jangle on our doorbell and some wretched soul in misery would be standing before us and pouring out his troubles. Suddenly the violin would be discarded, and Holmes the dreamer would become Holmes the man of action. Come, Watson, the game's afoot, he'd say. And in a few moments later, we'd be rattling off in a cab through the foggy, gaslit London streets. Yes, Doctor, I can imagine it was pretty hard for you to leave Baker Street. It was, Mr. Bartell. However, as it transpired, there was one more adventure awaiting us before we left. A few days before the actual move, I persuaded Holmes to take an afternoon off from his packing and accompany me on a visit to the laboratory of an old friend of mine, a Professor Jean Boulin. He was an eminent French scientist engaged in very important work at the London University. Well, by the way, this was at a period, Mr. Bartell, when radium was something extremely new and extremely rare. The university had just acquired a minute but invaluable portion of the element, and Professor Boulin was in charge of the research connected with it. I can remember the picture so well as Holmes stood in the laboratory talking with keen interest to the distinguished staff. Amazing, Professor Boulin. Quite amazing. Think that this tiny leaden vessel contains one of the most precious substances in the world. Yes, Mr. Holmes. We have a great deal to thank Madame Curie for. This new element may force us entirely to revise our concepts of all physical structure. Your research is a great responsibility, Bula. It is, Watson. But I must confess that I wish the authorities here would give me a freer hand. I foresee such infinite possibilities in the use, particularly the medical use of radium. But my conservative superiors seem to regard it only as a toy, a scientific curiosity. Limit your experiments accordingly, I suppose. Exactly. I'm given no opportunity to do anything that's in the least radical. Mm, it must be very disheartening. How can research ever get anywhere along those lines? It is a great misfortune, Holmes, that you've determined to retire to your bee farm. <laughs> uh, this project, we could use such an analytical mind as yours. <laughs> you flatter me, Professor. How many assistants do you have working with you, Buller? Three, but none of them are very inspired, I'm afraid. What? My best assistant is a man named Barker. He's a little on the conservative side, too. But he is extremely adroit. The other two, a young man called Taylor and the girl Gladys Hughes, they mean well. But gauche, I fear, is the only word to describe them. <laughs> why, why, why do you laugh, uh, Bula? I was just amused to observe that in describing my assistants, I chanced to be literal as well as figurative. It's odd that random symbolism can sometime, uh, uh, but never mind that. You would like to see the rest of the laboratory? Yes, yes, indeed we would. Yes, thank you very much. I have some extraordinarily interesting photographic plates that record the emanations of radium. They're over here. I think you will find them most fascinating. Baker Street, particularly when our rooms are full of packing cases, seems rather drab after the scientific stimulations of Professor Boulin's laboratory, doesn't it, old chap? Yes, it seemed drab even if we hadn't been to see him. I feel frightfully depressed, Holmes. 
I just don't know what I'm going to do without you. Oh, you're still a young man, Watson, and a susceptible one. You'll marry again. No, no, I won't. Yes, <laughs> you will, old chap. And you'll end up by being glad that your old roommate, your difficult, rather unsociable old roommate, is living in retirement on the Sussex Downs. Rubbish. I shan't feel anything of the kind. In any case, I don't think you'll be able to stay in retirement for long. Your mind is much too alert to be satisfied by being a sort of midwife to a bunch of beastly bees. Oh, dear Watson. I feel that you'll never eat honey again. Yes, you can laugh, Holmes, but I could see how excited you were when Boo suggested that you might help him with his radium experiment. Well, flattering suggestion, I must admit, my dear fellow. Just the same, I... Oh, now, who the devil's that? From the urgency of the tug on the bell pull, I'd say that it was a client. Then go and head him off, will you, old chap? Yes, I'll, I'll do my best. Oh, uh, Watson, explain that I'm no longer in practice. It's too late, Holmes. He's brushed past Mrs. Hudson. Here he comes rushing up the stairs. Oh, confound it. I beg your pardon, sir. Are you but, Mr. Uh, Sherlock you Holmes? Uh, no, I am not Sherlock. Then you must be Mr. Holmes. Uh, that is my name, sir. But may I ask what accounts for your rather whirlwind entrance? My housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson... I haven't any time to consider oh. etiquette. My sister Gladys Hughes has vanished. Vanished mm -hmm. into thin air. You've got to find her for me, Mr. Holmes. I'll pay you any fee you name, but you've got to find uh, her. Mr. Hughes, I'm extremely sorry that your sister has vanished, but I'm afraid that I can do nothing to help you. I'm retiring. I'm giving up my practice. If you won't help me, I'll go to someone who will. That's exactly what I mean, sir. I suggest that you go to the police, or if you insist on a private investigator, I can strongly recommend Mr. Martin Hewitt. Yes, his address is um, 39 Pont Street, Knightsbridge. Good day to you. Uh, good day, Mr. Hewitt. 36 Pont Street, Knightsbridge. <clears throat> Mr. Martin Hewitt. Yes, I can understand his concern, but his manners leave a great deal to be desired. Holmes, Holmes. Gladys Hughes, his missing sister, that was the name of... One of Professor Boulin's assistants, wasn't it? True, old fellow, but it's uh, probably only a coincidence. What? Both Christian and surnames are extremely common ones. Well, I... I have a feeling that it may not be a coincidence. <laughs> oh, come now, my dear fellow. Don't you try and embroil me in a fresh adventure. I've retired and I'm leaving for Sussex in a few days. And if any more clients come wrenching at my doorbell, I shall ignore them. <laughs> But, Mr. Holmes, you've got to help me. My son, Jeffrey Barker, has disappeared. I'm sorry, Mrs. Barker, but I'm afraid I'm... But Holmes, Jeffrey Barker was the name of Professor Boulin's chief assistant. Uh, Watson, please believe me when I say that I'm not to be inveigled into any further... Uh, Mrs. Taylor, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. Oh, but, Mr. Holmes, it's my husband. He's disappeared. We, we've only been married three months, and now... Oh, it's... Terrible. I, I've been so worried ever since he started to work on that strange new radium with Professor Jean Bellin. Holmes, you can't pretend it's coincidence any longer. Gladys Hughes, Jeffrey Barker, and now Taylor, the three assistants of Professor Bullard. Oh, I know it, Watson. Mrs. Taylor, the moving van will be here tomorrow to take, to take my things to Sussex. I shall follow them immediately. I have retired, madam. Do you understand that? Retired. <laughs> Yes, another telegram for you, Holmes. That'll be the fourth today. Why won't Scotland Yard leave me alone? Well, it's a pretty strange business. Three people engaged in research of this new element, radium, have all disappeared within 48 hours. Scotland Yard needs your help. Let them earn their salaries, my dear Watson. I've helped them for the last time. Well, let's see how they've couched their latest diffusion. Oh, this isn't from Scotland Yard. It's from my brother, Mycroft. Mycroft? What's he going to say? Listen to this. Now Professor Boulin has disappeared. Great Scott. And the radium with him. Surely the pattern is obvious, Sherlock. Radium must be found. Could solve the problem for you, but I'm too lazy. Consider what a flashy case for you to retire on regards Mycroft. Ha, <laughs> ha, the old devil. Holmes, this is shocking. My old friend Boulin has, has disappeared. Yes, Watson, and now my brother asks me to investigate. Hmm. The pressure becomes irresistible. Very well. I bow to fate and postpone my retirement for a few hours. Good man, Holmes. You know, you'll you'll never really retire. Now, let me see. As Mycroft says, there's an obvious pattern in this case. Our first step, of course, will be to interview all the doctors who treat patients without charge. Why? Well, surely that's obvious. Well, it isn't at all obvious to me. I don't know why you always leave me in the dark. <laughs> well, what makes you laugh? <laughs> Been left in the dark. It's just like the old times, isn't it, Holmes? <laughs> Come on, old fellow, let's go. The game's afoot. <laughs> Uh, Dr. MacDonald, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, eh? I'm very glad to meet you. And are you, uh, Dr. MacDonald? I swear that I've never been in as many doctor's offices as I have today. But Mr. Holmes is in search of some information 
Perhaps, Doctor, you, you can help him. I'll do my best. Uh, what do you want to know, Mr. Holmes? Uh, whether you have any charity patients with skin eruptions or growths of any kind. I mean, oh. patients that have not kept their appointments recently, perhaps. Now, let me see. Why, why yes, I do. Old Mrs. Pendle. She has a very bad case of lupus. She was due for a treatment here yesterday, and I've seen nothing of her. Splendid. Can you give me her address? Why, well, certainly. It's in my book here. Well, I hope this isn't a false trail, Holmes. You can only explore it and see, dear chap. Ah, uh, here we are. Mrs. Pendle, 36 Elm Gardens, Clapham. Mrs. Pendle, 36 Elm Gardens, Clapham. Thank you, Doctor. I'm greatly obliged to you. Getting restless, Watson? Yes, I am a little. We've been waiting outside Mrs. Pendle's house for over an hour. Why don't we knock on the door? She sees it home. Oh, no, 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 my dear chap. We mustn't frighten her. I hope that she's going to lead us to our quarry. You see... Shh, shh, shh. Front door's opening. A woman's coming out. Yes, it's Mrs. Pendle, beyond doubt. Look at that bandage around the upper part of her face. Yeah. Hello, she's turning down the street. We're going to follow her, I suppose. Naturally, but let's give, us a, let's give her a start, shall we? We don't want her to spot us. Well, while we're waiting, perhaps you'll clear up one or two points for me. I'm still very much in the dark. With pleasure, old chap. What puzzles you? Well, one of the things that Come I... Come do... Well? We've given her enough of a start. Let's follow her. Oh, very well, very well. But look here, um, You asked me what I didn't understand. Two things puzzle me. What did Mycroft mean by the pattern of the case? Why are we following a poor sick old lady through the London streets? I'll ask, answer the first question, and I think the answer to the second will be so apparent. The pattern of the case is clear. Professor Boulin and his three assistants have vanished together with the radium, but their disappearances were not simultaneous. Had they been so, it would have been a transparent case of theft. But with the disappearances gradual rather than simultaneous, the emphasis has been subtly shifted. Yes, I can see that, Holmes, but what do you suppose is the back of the whole business? Can't be a simple case of theft. Radium is enormously valuable. But it'd be hard stuff to sell again. Not to an unscrupulous criminal with a knowledge of medicine, Watson. My own theory, and I admit at the moment that it's purely a theory, is that Professor Boulin was worried because he was so hampered in his research. You remember that he stressed his great faith in the medical values of the new element, radium. Yes, 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 he did. It's more than possible that he places the rights of science above the rights of property, that he's determined that he and his group will carry on their invaluable research unhampered by the conservative restraints of the university. I see what you mean, Holmes, but how does Mrs. Pendle, the poor woman that we're following, enter the picture? Because one of the chief lines of radium research on the continent so far has been with her sort of trouble. Professor Boulin's obvious move, if my theory is correct, would be to contact poverty-stricken patients... Promise them relief, induce them to abandon their regular treatments, and submit to him. By Joe, yes, Holmes, that seems perfectly logical, and yet I can't believe that Boulin would Mrs. do... Mrs. Pendleton has uh, reached her destination. She's turned down a driveway. Yes, she's walking up to what looks like a, a deserted well. Howdy, old chap. Don't let her out of our sight. She's opened the door without knocking. She's gone in. We'll wait here for a moment or two, then we'll follow her. I have a feeling that your old friend, Professor Boulin, is not far away, Watson. Yes, you're probably right. But I hope we can do something to protect him from the consequences of what he's done. It might easily mean the finish of a brilliant career. I'll do everything in my power, but you know as well as I do... Shh, shh, shh. look, 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 look. Mrs. Pendle's coming out again. <coughs> yes, and she's in trouble. Come on. <coughs> Mrs. Pendle, what's wrong? I don't know how you know my name or who you be, but you ask me what's wrong... They tell me to come here to this address, and I find a doctor who dealt my face. I comes here, and what do I find? What did you find, madam? A corpse, sir. That's what I find. A dead man lying there in a great pool of his own blood. <laughs> You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. So I'm just going to remind you that there's one wine which everyone likes and which is good on any occasion. Petri California Sherry. You want a swell wine to serve before dinner? The perfect answer is Petri Sherry. If you want a wine that's delicious after dinner or later in the evening when you're just talking things over with your friends, again you want Petri Sherry. And if you want a wonderful wine to serve at cocktail time... Naturally, you want Petri Sherry. Sherry is a wine that's good at any time. 
And Petri, well, Petri is the wine that's good all the time. Well, Dr. Watson, so following the tracks of old Mrs. Pendle led you to a corpse, huh? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Of course, Sherlock Holmes and I went at once into the broken-down warehouse to examine the scene of the tragedy. Slumped over a desk in a dark and shabby room, a flickering candle giving a macabre liking to the scene was the body of a man. I think I knew its identity even before Holmes turned to me and said... It's Professor Boulin. All right, Watson. Poor devil. Murdered, of course. Yes, but examine him for yourself, will you? Yes. <clears throat> yes, there's no doubt about it. This wound couldn't have been self-inflicted. The right oracle of the heart has, has been pierced. How long ago would you estimate death took place? Well... Uh, not more than a, a couple of hours ago, I should say. Uh, not hard to reconstruct the killing. The murderer came up from behind Boulin as he sat here. <laughs> crooked an arm around his throat. Yes. See the finger marks on the right-hand side of the neck? Here? And then stabbed him in the chest. And then withdrew the weapon and disappeared. Leaving no traces, confound it. A dusty room is an ideal place for recording footprints, but uh, there are half a dozen different prints here, including Mrs. Pendle's. Hello. Here's the print of a smaller woman's shoe. Well, it must be that of Gladys Hughes, his assistant. Undoubtedly. But that really proves nothing except that she was here with him. A fact that we were convinced of anyway. Mm. Question is... Come on. Let's go outside and talk to Mrs. Pendle again. Poor old Bula. What a shocking way to die. And what a great loss to science. I suppose the murderer must have stolen the radium. We found no trace of it in there. Undoubtedly, the possession of the radium was the motive for the murder. Uh, Mrs. Pendle. The poor man is dead, ain't he, sir? I'm afraid so, madam. I knew it. I never should have come here. I never should have left Dr. MacDonald. Mrs. Pendle, let me ask you a question. I can't be answering no questions, sir. I don't know nothing about how the poor soul got himself murdered. What would a poor woman like me know about no, such no, things? No, 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 my good woman. My friend isn't suggesting at all that you know anything about the murder. Then what do you want to know, sir? Who told you to come to this address today, Mrs. Pendle? A young lady. Nice young lady she was, too. She met me coming out of Dr. MacDonald's yesterday and told me that if I come here today, I'd find a doctor who could cure me. Yeah, that was obviously Miss Hughes. Holmes, I believe that your theory was right. Come on, Mrs. Pendle. We'll escort you to the nearest police station where you uh, can report the murder. Yes, sir. And then, Watson, we must keep on the track of the radium. That, perhaps, is more important than any life. Well, how are we going to do that? We haven't a clue to go on. Remember that Professor Boulin's three assistants are still missing. We must go to the homes of each of them and see what can be found out. <laughs> Mr. Hughes, you must realize by now that your sister's disappearance is part of something vastly more significant than you think. I must ask you... In the my first... sister didn't disappear, Mr. What do you mean, sir? You came to us and said that you had. Oh, it was all a mistake, gentlemen. She came back today. She'd just been down to the seaside for a short rest, and she'd forgotten to let me know. I'm sorry to have bothered you. May I see your sister at once, please? I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, but she's out just now. I don't know where she's gone or what time she'll be back. Mrs. Barker, I've come to you about your son's disappearance. I'm afraid that... Oh, but my son didn't disappear, Mr. Holmes. It was all misunderstanding. He came home today. Then may we speak to him, please, Mrs. Barker? Oh, I'm afraid that's impossible. You see, he... Mrs. Taylor, I want to talk to you about your husband's disappearance. Oh, that... He came home this afternoon, Mr. Holmes. At first I was so suspicious, but... But when he explained, well... Well, I'm sure you know how it is in the first few months of marriage. Those, those little tears. Confound it, Watson. We are no nearer the solution. And meanwhile, here we are back in Baker Street to find that the moving van has taken all your things off to Sussex. Perhaps you should give up the case, Holmes, and follow them. Close my career on a note of failure. No, 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 my dear fellow. I shall not leave London until this problem is solved. Oh, in that case, I'll, I'll sit down. <coughs> Looks to me as if it may prove a lengthy wait. I've rarely felt more frustrated, Watson. All three vanished technicians home safely with plausible stories, or at least plausible alibis. And poor Boulin murdered, and the radium stolen. Well, I must say it makes no sense to me. Well, it must make sense. The pattern was well enough to find in the beginning. It's just a question of... Finding the right key. In a way, it's clear enough what's happened. One of the three assistants 
placing the financial value of radium above its value to science, murdered Boulin to obtain the prize. The other two, fearing that their complicity in the original plot would involve them as accomplices in murder, ran home and established an alibi. And the murderer did the same thing, for it's obvious one of the three must be the killer and the thief. Yes, the question is, which one of the three is the culprit? If only poor Boulin were alive, he could help us. My dear chap. If Boulin were alive, there would be no murderer. Oh, of course it wouldn't. Course he wouldn't. Now, let's see, let's see, let's see. Boulin gave us a few bare facts about his three assistants. I, I wonder... But, of course, Watson, I have the answer. The case is solved. What do you mean, Holmes? How can it be solved? You haven't done enough investigation. If it comes to that, you haven't even seen any of your three suspects. That isn't necessary. Oh, you know who did it? Yes, Watson, and so should you. But we know nothing to set them apart from each other, except that one of them's a girl. We know more than that, my dear fellow. Think hard. Well, Boulin told us that Jeffrey Barker was an excellent technician, while the other two were somewhat uh, we know, clumsy. We know even more than that. Well, I'm just if I know what, Holmes. I shan't even need to stay in London and follow the case through to its logical conclusion. A telegraph uh, to uh, Mycroft and another to... Uh, Scotland Yard should take care of it, yes. And I can be in Sussex before the moving van, after all. Oh, you mean you're going now before the case is solved? But it is solved, my dear fellow. All that remains to be done is some purely routine work. Uh, what's the time? Uh, let's look at just, uh, just three o'clock. Uh, splendid. If we hurry, we can catch the 345 Express from Waterloo. We? Yes, I, um, I was counting on you spending a few days down there with me, old chap. I, I hope you can spare the time. I should hate to make so drastic a change without, uh, my good old friend Watson at my side? Oh, of course, I'm uh, delighted, but... Uh, but but uh, what, my dear boy? The case of the disappearing scientists. Wait until we get to Sussex, shall we? Hmm? As soon as I get an answer to my telegrams, I'll explain the whole thing to you. And now let's hurry, shall we? Our train leaves in 40 minutes. <laughs> More tea, Watson? Thanks, old boy. Ah, peaceful down here, isn't it? Extremely. At the moment, I must confess, <clears throat> I find it rather nerve-wracking. Oh, why? Uh, well, you know why, Holmes. I want you to open that telegram and tell me if your solution to the, to the Woolan case is, was the correct one. Very well, my dear chap. Let's see. Uh-huh. It's from Mycroft. Listen. Murderer arrested and radium recovered. Well done, Sherlock, though you took longer than I expected. Regards, Mycroft. Mm, congratulations, Holmes. <laughs> and now perhaps you'll con condescend to, to tell me how you solved it. Don't be angry with me, old chap. I only wanted to make sure that my solution uh, was correct. You remember the, uh, the nature of the fatal wound on Boulin's body? Of course. He'd been stabbed through the right oracle of the heart. From behind. Proving that the murderer was... Clearly right-handed. Oh, what does that signify? Almost everybody's right-handed. Oh, no, not in this case. If you recall, Professor Boulin said that uh, Geoffrey Barker was adroit, while his other two assistants were gauche. Then he laughed because he said his remark was true, both literally and figuratively. I still don't see what I'm talking about. Oh, come now, Watson, come. Uh, think of the origin of the word adroit. Ardois. Droit is the French word for right. And gauche is, is the word for left. Meaning the two gauche assistants were left-handed, and therefore only the adroit, the right-handed Barker, could have inflicted the fatal wound. I see it now, Holmes. <laughs> you know, if you'd remembered that mark of Boulin's at the time we found his body, you could have solved the case much sooner. That's true, old fellow, very true. <laughs> and when my old friend Watson points out that my memory is failing and my mind sluggish, then I know that my retirement has been postponed for... Far too long. 